This is Sarah Threadster, NurseRN.com, and in this video, I'm gonna be going over sickle cell anemia. And this video is part of an NCLEX review series over hematology. And as always, don't forget to access the free quiz at the end of this video to test you on this condition. So let's get started. What is sickle cell anemia? This is where a patient has abnormal hemoglobin on their red blood cell. And the type of hemoglobin that we're talking about is hemoglobin S. Now the normal type of hemoglobin is hemoglobin hemoglobin A. Patients who have hemoglobin A, they don't have this condition. Only the ones who have hemoglobin S. And the thing to remember about hemoglobin S is that it is very sensitive to low amounts of oxygen in the body. So anything that causes the body to increase its demands for oxygen, like going to a higher altitude, infection, dehydration, things like that will cause these red blood cells to change their shape. And when they change their shape, they will become sickled shape like a C. They will become stiff and sticky. And we don't want our red blood cells to stick together in our circulation because if they do that they will block blood flow to important organs and tissues and things like that and our patient can enter into sickle cell crisis and we don't want them there so that's where a lot of our nursing interventions and treatments things like that are going to come from so when we go over that part of the lecture be sure to pay attention to that and another thing the anemia where's anemia part come from well because of these red blood cells unique shape of being a C shape, they are really weak. So they don't last as long as normal red blood cells. Normal red blood cells, how long do they last? About 120 days. These tend to rupture and break down in about 20 days. So the patient's going to suffer from anemia. The bone marrow can't keep up with production. And also the spleen is going to be affected as well. The spleen helps recycle those old red blood cells. It's gonna become overworked. Blood flow can get blocked to the spleen because of all this sticking together of these sickled red blood cells, which can overwork the spleen. And the spleen also helps us fight infection. And if our spleen's not working, because a lot of these patients have splenomegaly, they're gonna be at risk for infection as well. Now, there are different types of sickle cell disease and sickle cell anemia is the most common form and the most severe form of all the types. Now, what causes sickle cell anemia? Well, a person is born with it. They have inherited the abnormal hemoglobin S genes from each parent and it has caused them to receive both of them. It's a homozygous disease. So it means that they have hemoglobin SS on their red blood cell. And a lot of times you're gonna see patients who are super young presenting with these signs and symptoms and I'm talking about six seven eight months of age and what happens is that typically parent brings the child in they're like you know this child is not the same child that I gave birth to they're extremely fussy I can't it's they're not a happy baby they're crying all the time it's literally like they're in pain they have a fever and they have swelling in their hands and in their feet dactylitis also hand and foot syndrome and this is where these red blood cells have sickled they're sticking together they're blocking blood flow to that, those extremities organs causing lots of pain and the swelling now, why is this presenting now? Why didn't it present at birth at two, three months of age? Well, in utero and during that first six months of life, the babies had on board fetal hemoglobin, which is the main transporter of oxygen. But as that child has grown to six, seven, eight months of age, that fetal hemoglobin's role is diminished. And what it received in its genetic code from mom and dad they received hemoglobin ss that starts to take over and that is very sensitive to low oxygen and these red blood cells start to sickle so that is why that patient is going to start having sickle cell anemia so remember fetal hemoglobin because we're going to be talking about that with one of the medication treatments for this condition so what type of genetic blood disorder is this and i would remember this for testing purposes it is an autosomal recessive disease which means that in order for a patient to have sickle cell disease, they have to have written in their genetic code for their red blood cell, they have to be homozygous. So they have to have hemoglobin SS. They've got to receive that from each parent. So father will give them hemoglobin S from his code and mom will give hemoglobin S from her code. And whenever that happens, there's a 25% chance that the child will have hemoglobin SS. So that's how it occurs, which is 
the opposite for like autosomal dominant, where one parent just gives that abnormal gene and the parent usually has signs and symptoms of that disease. Because here in this disease, the parents usually are just carriers of it. They have sickle cell trait. So they don't normally have the signs and symptoms associated with sickle cell disease. It's very, very rare. So let's look at a scenario. We have our father and our mother. They have sickle cell trait. They carry the disease, but they don't necessarily show signs and symptoms of it because they have hemoglobin A, which is the normal hemoglobin, and hemoglobin S. So they have just enough of that normal hemoglobin to really prevent those red blood cells from changing their shape, from sickling. So you have father who has hemoglobin AS and mother who has hemoglobin AS. When they get together, have a child, there's a 25% chance that they're going to pass each of those hemoglobin S genes to that child and give them sickle cell disease. Now, what patient population is at most risk for developing sickle cell anemia? And I would remember this for testing purposes. According to the CDC.gov, one in 12 African Americans contain the sickle cell trait. So they may not necessarily know that they have this, but they have hemoglobin A and S. And since it's one in 12, it's relatively High chance that when two African Americans get together, they have a child, there's a 25% chance that they can each pass that hemoglobin S to their offspring and that offspring has sickle cell disease. It can also occur in Middle Eastern, Asian, Caribbean, and Eastern Mediterranean as well. Now let's talk about testing. What's available to test a patient for sickle cell anemia? Because as a nurse, you wanna be familiar with these tests. Okay, like I said, this disease is really found early on because our pediatric patients about six months onward can start presenting with this. So most hospitals have this as part of their newborn screening. Also babies still in the womb can be tested using the amniotic fluid to see if the abnormal hemoglobin is present. One of the most common, relatively easy ways is through a test called the thionite test, and it's also called Sickledex. And this will, it's a blood test, it takes the blood, and it assesses for that abnormal hemoglobin. But the thing about this test that I want you to remember is that it cannot differentiate between if the person has the sickle cell trait, just that normal hemoglobin, and then they also have the abnormal hemoglobin, so hemoglobin A and S, or if they actually have full sickle cell disease. So in order to determine that, they will need another test called a hemoglobin electrophoresis, which will help determine that. Now let's talk about pathophysiology. And we're gonna do this before we dive into sickle cell crisis and our nursing interventions. Okay, we're gonna begin with what a normal red blood cell should look like, because based on how it appears, it has a normal function compared to the sickled red blood cell. So a normal red blood cell should look similar to this. It should be nice and round, it should be smooth, it should be concave with a flat center on both sides. And what's really cool about red blood cells is that they do not have a nucleus. And this is actually really beneficial for the red blood cell, which is why they were created like that. And the benefits of this is that it allows them to easily squeeze through our vessels and carry oxygen. So what we're really concerned about in this disease is the hemoglobin found within the red blood cell. Now, what does normal normal hemoglobin do? It helps transport oxygen throughout our body. So it takes it that it received from the lungs and it takes it to all of our vital organs and tissues and helps it work appropriately. Now it can only do this really well if it has a normal type of hemoglobin, which is that again, that hemoglobin A. However, people with sickle cell anemia, remember they don't have that type of hemoglobin. They had hemoglobin S, which again causes the red blood cells to be stiff and sticky and form that sickle type shape which isn't very vessel friendly. They are going to start to stick together and they stick together so well that they can cause circulation problems. And when does this happen? When the body is experiencing low amounts of oxygen. So as the nurse, we have to educate our patients to avoid circumstances that cause that, which we're gonna talk about here in a moment. So these patients will experience these sickling episodes. 
And this is when those signs and symptoms are really going to manifest themselves. So it's really important to remember that most patients with sickle cell anemia, they're going to have anemia. And why are they having anemia again? It's because the lifespan of the red blood cell is short because that red blood cell is delicate and it ruptures. And they won't have major signs and symptoms until an actual crisis episode arises. And crisis episodes can vary among patients. And some can have them randomly while others can have them quite frequently. So now let's talk about the factors that can cause a sickle cell crisis. And I would remember these factors because tests love to ask you this along with the education pieces that go along with it. So to help us remember it, let's remember the word sickle because what's happening is that these are factors that are causing low amounts of oxygen in the body. It's either increasing the body's need for it or it affects how oxygen is being transported. So S, significant blood loss. This can be from surgery, a trauma. And why is this? Well, the body has just lost lots of blood, which is going to increase the demand of oxygen. All of our red blood cells are gone that actually had some oxygen on it. And this can lead to some sickling. I for illness. And uh, like I said earlier, because their spleen isn't going to be functioning properly just because of how much red blood cells are broken down, the spleen's blood flow can be diminished because of these cells sticking together, causing it to swell, they're at risk for illness. So a lot of times these patients are going to be on prophylactic antibiotics like penicillin to prevent infection. And infection can actually lead to one of these crises as well. So you wanna educate them about avoiding illness. C, climbing or flying to high altitudes and just going up in high altitudes increases the body's demand for oxygen. So this can lead to an episode. K, for keeping continued stress. This can be mental stress. This can be physical stress. Again, that alters the way that the body is using oxygen. L for low fluid intake and this leads to dehydration. That's why we, it's so important we teach patients you need to Watch your exercising. You don't need to become dehydrated. You need to drink regularly. Make sure you make it a priority that you're drinking fluids on a continual basis. E for elevated temperature. And this can arise from a fever or strenuous exercise. So you want to teach your patient, you know, you can work out, but don't overdo it because fever exercise increases the body's demands for oxygen, which stresses those hemoglobin S cells out and can cause sickling. Also, cold, extreme temperature change going from relatively warm environment to just like a freezing environment, maybe like jumping into icy cold water because that increases the body's way of being able to keep itself warm, which is gonna increase the demands of oxygen. So avoiding things like that where they're gonna immerse themselves into cold water. Now let's talk about what can go on during a sickle cell crisis. We just looked at the factors that can lead to one and we talked about what can send a patient into having an episode. Okay, so you can have a vaso-occlusive and it's just like the name says, in the vessels, they're becoming occluded. So these sickled red blood cells are sticking together so well in the vessels that it's dropping the blood flow to our organs and tissues. And this can lead to infarctions, you can have strokes, you can have issues with the kidneys, you can send them into renal failure, things like that because all these major organs are being affected. Also, you can have a hemolytic crisis where there's just the rapid death of these red blood cells because again, they're super fragile. They're not living very long, only about 20 days compared to the lovely 120 days they normally live. So they're breaking down. Now, as they break down, what do red blood cells release? They release bilirubin. And it's gonna be so much bilirubin that's being released that you're gonna see jaundice in these patients because they just break down so easily can also have a plastic crisis. And this is because the red blood cell production is literally coming to a halt because they're not living that long and your bone marrow can't keep up with trying to produce them every 20 days. So you're gonna have some periods where you're literally not having any red blood cell production. And the spleen can be involved with spleen sequestration. And this is where the spleen is not working. And again, like I said earlier, it's not working because you have those sickled cells 
in there, dropping the blood flow. It starts to swell with fluid and it gets congested. So because it's trying to keep up with all these red blood cells breaking down because it helps recycle those. And another thing it does is it helps filter our blood in a sense from those foreign invaders. So we're at huge risk for infection as well. Now let's talk about those signs and symptoms that you can see in a patient who's having a sickle cell crisis and let's mesh that together with the nursing interventions, what we're gonna be doing for the patient. Okay, so what's going on with their patient? What's priority? Well, they've entered into this crisis because they're probably dehydrated, their body is experiencing stress with low amounts of oxygen, so we've got to help combat that. And as you're gonna see, in a severe crisis, this can affect every system of the body, from the brain, to the gallbladder, to the kidneys, to the lungs. So as a nurse, hydration is a huge focus for us. We want to, per physician's order, have IV fluids on board, making sure that they're consuming fluids, because what's this gonna do? This is gonna help dilute the blood, because we have red blood cells that are sickle that are sticking together, and if we dilute that, that'll help alleviate that, and also help with renal function, preserving that blood flow to our kidneys, so that's one thing. Also, oxygen, these hemoglobin S on the red blood cell is already stressed from the oxygen that it's not really receiving, so if we give them some more, that can help alleviate that. Pain control is a huge thing we wanna do with these patients. This is very, very painful, and we want to make sure that we're treating that appropriately. They're gonna be on bed rest, and we want to monitor their respiratory status because they're at risk for acute chest syndrome with this condition. So, let's talk about those signs and symptoms. Dactylitis, we talked about that earlier. You're gonna really see this in the infants rather than the older children. That was like the swelling of the hands and the feet. We wanna elevate those hands and feet, those extremities to help promote blood flow because what's happening is those red blood cells are sticking together, decreasing perfusion to those extremities. Pain, like I said, they can have this back joints throughout wherever these episodes are happening and that's because of that ischemia that's occurring because those sickled cells decreasing blood flow. And the best way to treat it is opioid medications around the clock, not PRN as needed when they request it, but around the clock to help control pain because it's very, very painful. Also, warm compresses on wherever the pain's at. Not cold compresses, why not cold? Well, remember with one of our factors, cold can actually increase the demands of oxygen, which can stress those cells out and cause worse sickling. And we wanna make sure that we're not leaving restrictive items on them. If they have a watch on or they don't leave that blood pressure cuff on their arm because that's gonna impede blood flow even more, so make sure that they're not having anything restrictive on their extremities. Another thing, of course, is anemia. And if they are going through a hyperhemolytic or an aplastic crisis, they have that breakdown of red blood cells that's accelerated or they're just not really making any. And you gotta watch out for increased heart rate with this because the heart's trying to compensate for those low oxygen levels. Infants can be really tired or fussy. Shortness of breath, just where there's not enough oxygen present and whenever they just try to do a simple task, it's like, whoa. I'm really short of breath. Of course, low red blood cells, making sure that you're looking at those mucous membranes to assess for pallor, paleness, because most patients who have sickle cell anemia, they are African Americans, so in order to tell if they're pale, you need to look at the mucous membranes. Are they really light instead of the dark red pink color? And looking at the growth and development, because that can affect this in children with the severe anemia. So nursing standpoint, blood transfusions, replacing them with fresh new red blood cells, increasing that number, increasing the oxygen available to the body. Also folic acid, why folic acid? This helps with red blood cell production, so they may be ordered to take a supplement of that rather than iron. Iron supplements don't really help this type of anemia like the other anemias we've talked about. And in some patients with sickle cell disease, giving them iron supplements can actually cause toxicity where the iron will collect in the organs. So you want to avoid that. Now if you 
aren't familiar with blood transfusions from the nursing standpoint, I have a whole video on that that you can watch and access to help you review for NCLEX for that. Another thing is infection. We talked a lot about this. The spleen's not working well. There are huge risks for infection because that helps filter out our foreign invaders, plays a role with that. And so a lot of these patients can get pneumonia. So you wanna be looking at that respiratory status, assessing those breath sounds. What their, what's their oxygen saturation? How are they breathing? Because a lot of patients can enter into acute chest syndrome. This can be preceded by pneumonia or a pulmonary embolism. And a lot of times people with sickle cell disease have abnormal clotting. So they're at risk for um, throwing off clots as well. So monitor that. And if a patient has this, they will have a fever, chest pain, cough, low oxygen saturation. That will probably tip the physician off to order a chest x-ray, which is going to show usually a new infiltrate on the chest x-ray. So as a nurse, make sure you are being aware of that and thinking of that as well. Another thing is gallstones. Why in the world gallstones? Well, remember, we have the rupturing of our red blood cells. They're very fragile. So if you are breaking down lots of red blood cells because you're in the severe crisis, what do red blood cells release? Bilirubin. Well, the body can't deal with all this bilirubin. So the gallbladder, it starts to make stones out of it So because the gallbladder can't really keep up. So they will have that. So watch out for signs and symptoms of gallstones, like chest pain, similar to like heartburn. Even some people have reported it feels like they're having a heart attack, lower, pain in their shoulder where their shoulder blade as well getting nausea things like that next stroke this can occur because if those red blood cells are sticking together in important vessels that feed our brain tissue it can decrease blood supply and cause brain death and what you want to be doing is you want to make sure you're monitoring their neuro status with that as well and if you need an NCLEX review on stroke I have a whole one right there that you can check out as well another thing is eye problems and it's sort of the same concept all the sticky red blood cells that feed the nerves to the eyes can become blocked and they can have vision changes so assessing their vision making sure that they go and get regular vision checkups and leg ulcers this is typically in your older children not your infant so the dactylitis the hand and foot syndrome it's mainly in our infants our leg ulcers are going to be in our older children and this is the decreased blood flow, that vaso-occlusion to the leg. So they get ulcers that can be very painful and slow healing. Now let's talk about the prevention pieces on how to prevent a sickle cell crisis. Okay, what you wanna educate the patient or the parents is number one, they're at risk for infection. So you wanna tell them they wanna be getting their vaccinations up to date, especially the pneumococcal, influenza, and meningococcal because they're at risk for developing this and you wanna make sure they have those vaccines on board. Avoiding high altitudes, climbing, flying, preventing infection, hand hygiene, taking the prophylactic penicillin if that's what the physician has ordered, staying away from sick people, hydration, making sure that they are staying on top of drinking fluids, consuming fluids, especially on days when it's hot. That's usually the last thing you're thinking about, but if you're getting sweaty, you're gonna be working out, you want to make sure you're keeping your hydration because this can send you into one of these episodes. Keeping stress levels low, not smoking, and not overdoing exercise. Now let's quickly talk about some medications used to treat sickle cell anemia. A common one is called hydroxyurea. And this medication is actually used to treat some forms of cancer, but they have found that it actually can help some sickle cell anemia patients. Now what does it do? Now remember I told you to remember that about the fetal hemoglobin. Well, this is what this medication does. It creates the fetal hemoglobin, which is going to decrease that sickling. So remember that fetal hemoglobin was what was present in that baby, that first six months of life that helped them transport oxygen. Then they get a little bit older and their genes take over producing hemoglobin SS and they get sickle cell disease. So this, we can throw this on and it will help create that fetal hemoglobin protein. And it also will help with anemia, which will decrease the need for so many blood transfusions. But one thing about this medication that you wanna watch out for and educate the patient about is that it lowers the white blood cell count. So that'll need to be watched and you'll need to teach the patient good hand hygiene, avoiding people with infection. Now, is there a cure for sickle cell anemia? Well, a stem cell transplant can be performed 
where the bone marrow will be made to produce new healthy red blood cells without the abnormal hemoglobin on it. However, it's rare because patients must be matched with a donor to have a successful stem cell transplant. Okay, so that wraps up this lecture over sickle cell anemia. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.